thank you everybody for joining us for the Olson Grand Rounds this week. I'm pretty excited to continue on this series that we've been doing. I know in the fellowship we've been talking a little bit about renal ultrasound uh, over the course of the last several weeks, and we're going to wrap things up with something that's kind of tangentially related. And I know they talked about it a little earlier in our, you know, just private didactics for the Olson Fellow, but we're going to talk about testicular ultrasound today. Um, it is, like I said, tangentially related, uh, but it's something that's certainly within the, the realm of things that we can scan in the emergency department or, or other different places where we have patients that, uh, that bear this anatomy. So with that being said, let's dive on in. Uh, we'll cut away from my face and we'll go to uh, a little bit of a case. Um, so imagine, like I like to, to start off our, our conversations generally talking um, about a case, just kind of set the stage so we can get some vague understanding of, of where we're going and kind of get our minds engaged and, and stuff like that. And so um, today's case uh, is basically, um, as always, either highly modified or completely made up. Uh, and in this case, it's completely made up, uh, but it would bear resemblance to something that you would see in the department um, you know, as you're seeing patients. Uh, so you have to suspend disbelief a little bit for the purposes of HIPAA uh, compliance. Uh, but imagine yourself working um, a shift in the emergency department or some urgent care center, um, and uh, you are seeing a 14-year-old patient with left-sided groin pain. Um, so they come in and say, hey, look, uh, my groin is hurting. It started hurting, I don't know, um, this morning. You know, um, imagine yourself at the same time and place. Right now it's noon. They said it started about nine this morning. Man, it really hurts. Maybe you felt kind of nauseous, kind of wanted to throw up. Um, but it's like really, really, really hurting. And it kind of radiates up to the flank and radiates down, the test, down to the testicle. Um, and when you do your exam, um, you know, obviously when you think about groin area pain, you think about kind of that, that referred pain axis kind of all the way from the testicle all the way up to the flank. And so it could be anything from the kidney all the way down to, uh, to this young kiddo's testicle. Um, and so you have to think about things in that spectrum. And, you know, I was reminded the other day when I was seeing patients, um, I had a, a young pre-teenage person with flank pain. I'm like, oh, it can't be a kidney stone uh, because of the age. It just seems unlikely. And they ended up having a kidney stone. So you have to think all the way up. But then as I uh, try to remind myself when I'm seeing patients clinically, as well as when I'm working with my residents and say, hey, look, they come in with lower abdominal pain. You have to consider what's under the pants, right? Uh, especially for these young dudes. Um, you know, you can have re really weird referred pain patterns um, that has a testicular origin that's now causing you pain kind of in your right lower quadrant and your suprapubic area or the kind of the groin, um, you know, inguinal area. And so you have to have to look, have to, to think about that. And so when we do our thorough exam, you notice that um, the um, there's, you know, some tenderness, maybe not so much in the way of CVA tenderness, um, you know, but they definitely have some, some scrotal tenderness, very... Um, you know, a, a tender kind of left hemiscrotum here. Um, you know, there's an abnormal lie. You know, one side looks a little bit different than the other. Um, you know, and so um, as you're examining it, you know, maybe they scream when you kind of try to palpate. Uh, but from an uh, you know, appearance standpoint, there's no like erythema, no infectious uh, symptoms. Uh, and so you try a cremasteric reflex and either due to lack of skill or due to the patient's presentation, it's really kind of, you know, it's okay on the right side, but not really terribly clear on the left side. Um, and so it kind of leaves us with this whole idea of, okay, we got to do something next, right? So we have to then kind of use our doctoring skills. We got to come up with some differential diagnosis where we say, okay, here's the patient's presentation, kind of left lower quadrant, left inguinal area pain, maybe seems to have a testicular origin. Um, you know, although renal is certainly a possibility, but less likely given our exam, what's our differential? And so you work your way all the way down that anatomic pathway of could they have some kidney problem, um, whether it be a, like an infectious problem or a stone, or do they have a ure ureter problem, like a stone in transit or a, you know, UTI, um, you know, pylo, it kind of hinted at that, but then also like we're getting down to the scrotum. So we're like, is this a testicle that's torsed? Is it epididymitis orchitis? Um, you know, all things like this, or maybe it's just like a, a large hydrocele, you know. So um, that differential diagnosis kind of opens up a, a workup pathway. And since the, the epicenter of all this patient's pain seems to be kind of in that left hemiscrotum, we're going to really go there uh, with the rest of our thought process and then obviously work up in this particular case. And so that brings us to today's topic, right? Um, I have uh, humorously titled this um, Twisted, right? It's a... Um, 
and the ultrasound evaluation for testicular torsion. And this is really an opportunity for us just to kind of evaluate ultrasound, how we can apply this, um, again, in, the in our emergency department, if you have a patient on the, the wards that you happen to be seeing or in the urgent care environment, you know, how we can use ultrasound to evaluate these uh, patients. And it's really an opportunity for us to re-engage with our junior high selves and just kind of snicker a little bit um, as we can think of all these amazing puns um, that we're talking about. Um, you know, testicular torsion, kind of with that warped, twisted sense of humor that we all physicians have. So with that being said, let's dive on in uh, and talk a little bit more about testicular ultrasound. Uh, and my goal today uh, is really, I guess having a picture of a hammer following a, a conversation about testicles is a, a little bit of a mental stretch. But my goal today is really, this picture refers to the fact that I want to give you some tools that you can use at the bedside um, as you're seeing these patients that you can uh, use to kind of help perform, read, and then interpret this testicular ultrasound um, when you're evaluating the patients for torsion, right? And so um, as any good talk, I want to tell you what we're going to talk about. I want to talk about it. And then I want to tell you what we talked about, you know, as we kind of wrap things up. And so this is the first part. I'm going to tell you what we're going to talk about on the front end here. We're going to talk about testicular torsion, right? And specifically, after we talk a little bit about torsion itself, and I don't want to supplant kind of the urologist um, level expertise in that, in that regard, uh, but if we talk a little bit about testicular torsion, we're going to talk specifically and probably for the most of our time about the ultrasound findings, namely the grayscale findings, the color Doppler findings, and then the spectral Doppler findings. And then we'll wrap it all back up. And hopefully that gives us some more tools that we can use to, um, <clears throat> to demystify and kind of untie the knots in our brain as we're looking for, um, you know, for these testicular torsions. You like that pun? I'm going to keep doing that. Um, so testicular torsion um, by itself, right? Um, big picture is a, a twisting of the testicle and the spermatic cord with inside the scrotum, right? Leading to acute testicular pain and ischemia. And ultimately that's resulting from this vascular compromise. So we don't have enough blood flow because we kind of pinched off the supply. Uh, and that's going to cause some ischemia and long-term effects if we don't re, um, re-perfuse this testicle and obviously loss of function and things to that effect, right? Um, and if, if untreated, it will result in testicular infarction and testicular loss, right? And so um, as, as a kind of a broad entity, we got to think that it can happen, um, you know, in these two peaks, right? Generally, we see it in kind of in infancy uh, and then kind of this adolescence. Although, you know, any of us who's been practicing long enough in the appropriate clinical settings would say that it can, you know, we've seen it happen in, in age ranges outside these typical standard bimodal peaks. Um, but it certainly uh, is, you know, something that you would see kind of traditionally clustered uh, inside those peaks. And there's two different ways of categorizing these things, and we'll talk about it here in just a minute. You have the, either the intravaginal testicular torsion or the extravaginal. It has to do with kind of the layers and surrounding tissue layers uh, around the testicle. Um, but with that being said, generally speaking, we say salvage rate for testicular torsion um, is really, really good if you detorse it within six hours, right? So if they come in and say, hey, man, this thing's killing me. Can you do something about it? And you figure it out and do it right away. Your, your likelihood of salvaging this thing is, is pretty good. Um, but as that time goes by, right, you know, we talk about in strokes and heart attacks, you know, time is brain, time is heart. Same thing applies here. Time is testicle, right? And so as that time goes by, right, um, and that that period of time elapses from when you first notice symptoms, the salvage rate goes down. And so some sources, and the sources are a little bit all over the place, but some sources that I say, um, is that salvage rate is approximately 20% after 12 hours of, of onset of symptoms. And I think there's a lot of caveats come into play. Is it persistent symptoms or is it torse detours, you know, uh, things like that. But the longer you leave this, um, the, 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 the less optimal outcomes you're going to, you're going to get. And so really, uh, as the frontline provider, as you're seeing these, these patients, you really need to get, get on top of this, uh, get the ball rolling uh, in con con um, consulting your, your, your specialist and kind of get the diagnosis made. So we should have a bingo of how many puns we can make. So that was, that was another one. Um, anyway, as we kind of move on here, um, testicular torsion, like I said, usually follows this kind of bimodal pattern. It's usually seen in infants, uh, seen in older children. Um, but we should always keep it, um, you know, on our differential diagnosis. And there's some nuances in the anatomy that really come into play. And so if we think about the an anatomy itself, the tes testicle itself here, kind of pictured in that blue and yellow uh, organ structure, sits within kind of the scrotum. It's covered on most surfaces by the tunica vaginalis, right? And so you think about uh, just a, 
a, a analogy scenario, right? Think about, take a balloon, right? Fill it up a little bit and then take your fist and punch into that balloon. Uh, you're gonna have most of your fist covered with at least one portion of that balloon, right? Um, and then obviously the outside of the balloon is gonna be the other portion, but there's gonna be a bare spot, right? The place where your wrist is, where you cannot get that balloon to completely envelop your hand. Um, and that's gonna be kind of analogous to the, the anatomy of the testicle as it pertains to this tunica vaginalis. And so that posterior aspect, right? That bare spot, that wrist corollary as, as it were, um, is really gonna help anchor that testicle inside the, um, inside the scrotum and help it not twist. But when you have abnormalities with that, um, when that, that bare spot is maybe smaller than it ought to be, uh, or is you know abnormal, uh, it gives us what's called those bell clapper deformity um, and uh, provides less anchoring for that testicle and allows it to kind of torse uh, or twist inside, uh, in the inside the testicle. And that's where we get kind of this idea of the intravaginal testicular torsions, right? Inside that tunica vaginalis where the whole thing just kind of twists inside of it. Um, contrast that with the extravaginal uh, testicular torsions where the whole thing, right, uh, just torses uh, and can cause some problems. But ultimately at the end of the day, right, what happens is that twisting provides some, you know, some compression of the vasculature, first the venous side, then the arterial side of that testicle. Um, that then is going to result in kind of a loss of, of blood flow uh, to that testicle. Um, and as we, you know, as we kind of remember on, in everything in medicine, not much is bi or not much is um, binary. Everything kind of exists on a spectrum, and so you can have that torsion exist on that same spectrum of, you know, a mild degree to a moderate degree to a severe degree. Um, and so there may be some nuance in terms of the case presentation and the salvage rates and things like that with how torsed the thing is, uh, whether it's going to be partial obstruction or complete obstruction. Um, and ultimately, from a clinical outcome standpoint, that's not our thing, that's a, that's a urology thing. Um, our job is to diagnose it and get them to urology to get urgent decompression or detorsion. However, what it may influence is some of the um, things that you will see on the ultrasound um, as we kind of move on to the next section. So with that said, that's kind of a good transition uh, for us to move on to the next part. And that is, let's talk about the ultrasound findings of, testic of testicles um, and then how that applies to testicular torsion, right? Uh, and so the first thing that we'll talk about, you know, with ultrasound specifically is the grayscale. And so we're gonna move along kind of this, this pattern of, of um, you know, of how we do it, but also pattern of complexity where we build from the grayscale appearance and then we're gonna add different things to it, namely color Doppler, then spectral Doppler as we kind of evaluate this testicle and say, hey, is this thing, you know, viable or is this thing torsed or kind of what's the deal here? So um, the first thing when it comes to the testicle and the grayscale findings is we wanna look at two, two aspects, right? We wanna look at um, number one, I mean, I, it's assuming the presence, right? They, that they actually have a testicle. Um, as opposed to something that's you know not present um, for whatever reason. Um, but the first thing we want to look at is, is it of appropriate size? And then secondly, is it of appropriate echo texture? Um, and so testicles themselves are actually pretty decently easy to scan. Um, you know, as long as you can kind of position things appropriately so you have, you know, the support that you need that when you put your probe on, it doesn't just kind of completely fall away. Um, they're pretty easy to scan because they're very, very superficial, right? And so actually a technique that I was taught long ago is you can lay the patient down, right? You take a towel, you know, kind of fold it in half the, the long way um, and kind of drape that as um, kind of a drape underneath the scrotum to kind of help elevate it. And maybe I'll put some towels underneath that to kind of support it. Um, and then you can lay a, a towel, you know, across the top. So all that's exposed is the, is the scrotal sac. And um, it gives you a really nice base to kind of evaluate this thing, both in your long axis, you know, your sagittal orientation, and then your short axis, uh, or your transverse orientation. Um, but back to this whole idea, it's very superficial, right? So it's easily visualized uh, with a copious amount of gel, and preferably warm gel for the sake of the patient. Um, it can be, you know, you can easily scan it and, and find the thing. Um, and the size itself, you know, as you can imagine, is going to be relatively variable, right? And so if you want to do like a, you know, full on, you know, protocolized method, you can find it in long axis and short axis and measure the different dimensions and then compare that to reference standards. Um, or you can say, hey, look, it's going to be relative to the patient's, you know, age and their pubertal status, right? And so um, measurements is good, but I don't rely hugely on, you know, what's the specific measurement, but more of a comparison with, 
you know, your built-in anatomy, your built-in normal, right, on the other side. Um, but the testicles themselves should be relatively equal size, right? And so of varying sizes as you grow, uh, but they should be relatively equal size to one another. And so it's really important as you're scanning these to not only scan the one that you're worried about, you know, the in this case, the left side, um, but also scan the other side so that you can kind of compare with normal and say, is there something that's different in terms of the size? Because as you, you can imagine as you torse, right, you can provide some venous congestion, especially if you have arterial flow, but like obstruct the venous outflow. And so you may get various size changes, um, kind of some swelling uh, in these testicles that, that, are, that are starting to be torsed. Um, but the other thing that you want to notice is the echo texture, right? Um, and so by echo texture, I just mean kind of the grayscale appearance. Um, a normal testicle itself should have just kind of this homogenous mid-gray echo texture. I mean, we compare a lot of things to stuff that we do all the time, and that's easy. Um, and the, co the corollary would be the liver, right? And so we always compare, look at, you know, how does this echo texture compare with the liver? Um, and the liver, if you remember, is just kind of this homogenous, you know, in its normal condition, right? Homogenous uh, mid-gray uh, echo texture. And that's kind of what we'd expect to see, just kind of this oval-shaped, liver looking thing um, in the in the scrotum right um, and so you know as always you want to kind of scan through from top to bottom from side to side uh, but you should not see a, a profound degree of variability uh, in that echo texture inside the scrotum and then when we compare it to the other side you should see the the smoothness or the echo texture should appear the same and also the echogenicity like how bright or how dark the thing is should be relatively the same. And when you see a profound difference, that should clue you into something, you know, maybe something's amiss here. Um, so it's another example of why you should scan um, these testicles, you know, individually and then side by side uh, as you're comparing uh, one another or each of them. Now, the caveat to that, and one thing that you'll notice is an anatomic, um, like a normal anatomic structure, and you may see this hyperechoic linear band uh, that kind of disrupts the, the normal homogenous echo texture of this testicle. And this is normal, right? This is called the mediastinum of the testicle, uh, and is basically, um, you know, embryologically an uh, invagination of the, uh, the tunica albiginia, uh, but it also serves as kind of that, that hilum, or that po point of entry uh, for the vessels and the ductwork of the testicle. And so we can kind of imagine a corollary like with lymph nodes where you have kind of that hilum and then the surrounding cortex. It's kind of a similar idea here. This is just the anatomic variant that you would expect to see, or not anatomic variant, this is the anatomic normal structure uh, inside the testicle, but the rest of it should remain decently homogenous and, and pretty boring, essentially. Um, now, we talk about that, we emphasize all that, uh, because when you start seeing abnormalities to that, then that's gonna clue you into something's wrong with this testicle, right? And so, one of the big concerns that, that people have um, with scanning things that they're maybe not completely familiar with is, what if I miss, like, what if I miss that cancer, right? Um, and while that's a concern, and certainly it should be a, a source of, <clears throat> uh, opportunity for you to you know look through atlases and kind of educate yourself a little bit more and become more familiar with the different echo textures of those things it all comes back to let's think through the context of kind of what we're scanning what we'd expect to see right and with a with a testicle it's a small oval shaped round homogenous echo texture thing and when we start having variations on that when we start uh, deviating from that normal then that gets into the realm of something's wrong here, something needs to be further worked up. And if our skill set allows us to identify that, great. And if not, that should be serving as a nidus for, hey, let's get this patient to a more comprehensive form of imaging, right? You know, in, in this context, a radiology form of imaging. Um, and in my opinion, right, and this is getting into a little bit of a point of care philosophy, in my opinion, you've done your patient not, not a harm, but you've done your patient a service by doing the scan um, because you've identified something that needs further workup uh, that may not have been identified uh, based on inspection or palpation alone. And so don't let this, this modality scare you, um, you know, but use that as an opportunity to number one, educate yourself, but also kind of continue to provide a more detailed understanding of the patient's um, you know, anatomy and physiology and, and employ appropriate tests even beyond your point of care ultrasound. But with that caveat, with that um, you know, philosophic soapbox aside, let's go back to this image, because this one's kind of interesting. Uh, it, it is a very, uh, an image that's very different than what we'd expect, right? And so we said it's a homogenous, oval-shaped echo texture, but what we see is a very heterogeneous 
mixed echogenicity um, echotexture with inside this, this testicle. Uh, and this is kind of what a torsion might look like uh, on grayscale. Now, I say might because you know, early on, you might not see any difference, right, on your grayscale, right? Um, it may take multiple hours of, of, of ischemia to get an appearance that looks something abnormal where you have an alteration to your grayscale. And so you cannot use grayscale alone to rule out a torsion, but if you see something super duper abnormal, like this kind of swirl, I, I don't want to say swirl because that has uh, other implications, you know, in, in in torsion, but if you see the kind of this mixed echogenicity, um, you know, scan, this should say, hey, something's abnormal. We need to need to, to dig into this further, both in our study and maybe in um, you know in, in other studies. Um, but this is kind of uh, what you'd get when you see kind of this vascular congestion mixed with you know or, you know various different stages of of ischemia of the the tissue or the parenchyma itself, right? And so. Uh, that's grayscale. A couple of other things that you may find in the grayscale workup, um, you know, which are of varying degrees of, of, of usefulness, is this idea of the whirlpool sign. So if you scan a little bit proximal to the, the spermatic cord, you may see kind of this spiraling uh, appearance of, those, of the spermatic cord contents itself. Uh, and that's been shown to be decently, um, you know, decently accurate at finding uh, testicular torsion. So it's something that may be present. I've definitely seen in my own practice um, reports from radiology come back saying a whirlpool sign. Um, and so that obviously should clue you into things um, that there may be some, some torsion there. Um, the other things you may find that you know, may be present in torsion, but may not be specifically diagnostic of torsion is, is the orientation abnormal? And, and does it not kind of get the oriented the way the other one is? Uh, or is there a hydrocele, right? Sometimes you can have a little bit of a hydrocele, but again, the hydrocele alone isn't necessarily diagnostic, well, isn't at all diagnostic of torsion um, on its own. That can happen, you know, for other reasons. So those are some of the grayscale findings. Let's move on now with that foundation built of what normal looks like and what some abnormals might look like and talk a little bit about the next layer uh, of, of scanning that we want to do to these patients just to kind of help further identify what's going on and that's the color doppler right and so if you think about the testicle itself and you think about torsion you know it's obviously a twisting of the, of the organ system right uh, to the point where you're cutting off the blood flow right and so from a big picture standpoint you know if you want to think broadly you should expect to see a decrease in flow theoretically uh, in a condition that's going to cause decrease flow, right? Uh, and so that's kind of what we're, uh, what the, the whole goal is as we're doing the, the color Doppler and even the spectral Doppler portion um, of, of torsion. And it can help us kind of narrow that, that differential down from, man, something's weird about this testicle, you know, some parenchymal problem to it's, it's weird because we have a vascular problem. So um, this is just a fun picture of Doppler, um, completely, taken from something else. This is taken from the heart where you put M mode and Doppler on at the same time. It gives you this really cool thing, really cool appearance. Um, and so Doppler um, makes your pictures look really, really pretty. Um, and it's an instant way to make you feel like you uh, know a lot of stuff. Um, you know, and, uh, but uh, in this situation, it's more just a, just a filler picture, just kind of make it look nice. Uh, but we're gonna learn how to, what we're gonna learn about is how to take this concept or the thing that makes this red and makes this blue and apply this specifically in our patient with the testicular torsion. So uh, with that being said, I think this serves as a good, um, uh, a, a good opportunity for us to back up and, and talk a little bit about Doppler and what makes that you know, plume red and what makes that plume blue and why it does what it does on the screen. So it's all based on this whole idea of the Doppler effect, right? And we were talking about this down in the ultrasound office yesterday, uh, a little bit about kind of what ultrasound does um, and how we get this. And so if you can imagine the ultrasound machine spits out, you know, a sound uh, at a particular frequency, right? And it receives that frequency back or that sound back. Uh, and if it receives it back at a frequency other than what it sent it at, something happened in the transit, in the course of transit, that caused that frequency to change, right? And so if the frequency is sent out at X and it came back at X plus five, uh, something happened to speed up that frequency um, versus if it came back at X minus five, something happened to slow that thing down. And so there's, in this situation, what we see on the far left of the screen, a delta F, right? A delta frequency. And we know from the Doppler principle that that is happening because of some impact of a moving object, right? 
Um, the analogy that I like to give is you know, when you hear the ambulance go by and the siren's high pitched and then as it passes you it goes to low pitched. Uh, or one of my sons loves trains, right? And you, you can kind of imagine that train whistle going by in your head. It goes from this high pitch down to this low pitch as the thing passes you. And that's the example of the Doppler principle in action, right? Um, and what you're seeing is things moving towards you have a compressed frequency, so it's going to be higher. And things moving away from you have kind of this decompressed frequency, so it's going to be lower. Um, and we can, gr we can put that on a math problem or put that on paper by saying that the change in frequency, whatever that frequency change is, is equal to the frequency received minus the frequency transmitted, right? And so that makes sense, right? The machine spits out a frequency, it hears it back as something different. There's a delta there, right? That delta F is that FR minus FT, right? Uh, you can further say that that frequency change, right? That delta F is equal to two times the frequency transmitted times the velocity of whatever object you're interrogating divided by the speed of sound, right? The, the constant there is the speed of sound. Uh, and I don't expect you to memorize this, but look at the factors that are involved in this, this equation, right? The change in frequency is related to the velocity of an object and the speed of sound, right? And the speed of sound is decently fixed. I mean, we all know that it's not completely true. Uh, every tissue type has a slightly different speed of sound, but they all center around that 1540 meters per second, right? Um, um, but, you know, what it's really shown us is that the delta frequency is kind of correlated to the velocity of whatever is, is being interrogated, right? So the frequency received, frequency transmitted, velocity of the object, speed of sound in the medium, right? So frequency, change in frequencies relatively correlate to the, the velocity of an object, right? And so we see this in, a, in in application here in the heart. We have blood flowing into the left ventricle. We have blood flowing out of the left ventricle, right? Um, now, how do we know? The machine then takes um, the the velocity change, right? That positive or negative variation of the of the frequency, and uses color to interpret kind of what that um, what that direction is, right? And so by convention, you'll see this in the little um, corner, you know, diagram at the top of the screen. By convention, velocities that move toward the transducer are going to be displayed in various shades of red and yellow, right? They're red, orange, and yellow. And then velocities moving away from the transducer are going to be in various shades of blue. And so if we go back to the image that we were at before and kind of apply that principle, we can see that that red plume that's on the right-hand side of the left ventricle there is the inflow from the mitral valve. It makes sense kind of as we see this moving anatomically. And that blue plume is the outflow from the ventricle through the left ventricular outflow tract, right? And you can see how um, you can see that relative velocity direction displayed in the color. And then also, if you notice on the upper right, you know, key there, there's a, a variation from kind of dark red to yellow, and that reflects the, the relative velocity. So how fast the thing is going. So the stuff that's yellow tends to be faster blood flow, and the things that are uh, darker color tends to be slower blood flow, and the same applies for the blue side of the scale, right? And so that's kind of the you know, how we get the image, uh, but we can distort this image in a couple different ways, right? And so if we have the, the color gain turned way too high, right, which we saw initially in this clip, and we'll come back to it in just a sec here, the sensitivity of our machine to listen for these velocities, um, you know, changes is way too high and you may have this bleed over effect. So you need to make, make sure your color gain is appropriately set for the vessel that you're looking at. Um, as we kind of see it gets turned down here and then all of a sudden the vessel, you know, doesn't overflow the banks and you can kind of see the, the normal contours of that vessel, right? The other thing that we can do to distort this is have an inappropriate pulse repetition frequency. And it's basically how fast does the machine send out these ultrasound signals? And what we know is that you have to send the ultrasound signals at a certain rate you know, to be able to pick up a certain velocity. So your rate of the signals has to be faster than the velocity itself. Um, and so if you are too low, right, if your rate is of, of sending the signals is too low, you may not pick up the, the, the Doppler signal well at all. And if it's too high, you may have this aliasing effect. Um, I think I said that backwards. If it's too low, you'll have this alias, aliasing effect where you, um, you can't, you know, 
can't determine what direction it's going because it's just all a jumble of different frequencies versus if it's too high it may not be fast enough to or maybe you know so fast you're just not picking up these slow velocities and so you want to set your pulse repetition frequency um, on your machine so that you have kind of this smooth appearance not this speckled appearance that that you see here or the aliasing that uh, that is present and so once you've kind of corrected those two um, you know, technical issues and kind of have your optimal pulse repetition frequency set and your optimal gain setting, then we can apply the color Doppler to the testicle itself, right? And we'll come back to, you know, our original topic of discussion, that is, what is this uh, tool that we can use to evaluate for torsion, right? Um, and so if you put your color box on the testicle, you'll see kind of the speckling of color signals throughout the testicle. Uh, and as we, as we can imagine, this is going to represent blood flow, like these small little vessels that are going to go either toward the transducer or away from the transducer, as is demonstrated by the, um, the red and the blue uh, flow in the testicle. And what we have to remember here is red doesn't equal artery and blue doesn't necessarily equal vein. You know, it might, uh, depending on the direction, but it, it doesn't always correlate, right? And so you can have red signals here that are venous, and you have blue signals that are arterial, and vice versa. And so what we're looking here is a, is a gestalt of how perfused does this testicle seem to be, right? But it's not telling us whether or not that's arterial flow versus venous flow. Uh, now, for a certain you know, patients, if they're in a low flow state, uh, or you want better sensitivity, you can put color power Doppler on, uh, and it's more, it's more sensitive for low flow states. Uh, so it's helpful as you're looking for these signals, uh, especially in these small little vessels, but what you lose is the directionality uh, component of that, that Doppler to say, is it t towards or away? Uh, and so for us, as we're looking for, is there flow binary, yes or no, you know, you may be able to sacrifice that directionality um, you know, and use the, the color power Doppler, but we're still going to need to do something else to determine is there arterial flow and is there venous flow, right? Um, but again, it's a tool that can help you if you're worried about torsion and you're just not seeing anything, you want to see if there's any, any low flow state. But let's apply this color principle towards torsion and kind of see how we can apply it here. Uh, so if we go back to this image that we showed earlier, which, you know, was obviously pilfered off of Google, uh, we can see that on the right-hand side, uh, labeled left there, but on, the, on our right-hand side, you can see that, that speckled appearance, that grayscale appearance that made things look abnormal. They're like, hmm, we need to look into that. Uh, and on the, the patient's right, our left here, you can see a normal testicle. So you have that normal gray echo texture. And you can see some, some fill-in of the vasculature, right? You can see those blue... Uh, streaks with a couple of red speckles. So we, we know that with these Doppler settings, right, uh, that we're getting flow in the normal testicle. And when we apply that to the other side, we don't see any flow at all, right? We see no blue, no red. There's an absence of flow here. And so this is highly concerning for testicular torsion, uh, where you can say, hey, look, I don't have flow in one. I do have flow in the other. My settings did not change. That means something's you know you know precluding the flow from reaching the testicle uh, on the abnormal side, and so that's certainly reasonable logic to apply. Uh, the caveat to this is you have to be very careful that you apply the same Doppler settings to either side of the testicle, right? So it doesn't do you any good to do one settings on one side, some other settings on the other side, because that's really going to affect the view that you're going to have. And so it's good to you know do each test to evaluate each testicle individually, but also to the extent that you can get a shot of both sides at the same time with the color box overlying both testicles to show that there is either similar flow on both sides or there's a variation of flow uh, from side to side, right? And so that's um, the findings of, of Doppler ultra or color Doppler ultra on testicular torsion, basically loss of Doppler flow or asymmetry of flow. And again, another caveat that we have to keep in mind is if you have uh, a a, or a detorsion event, right? So if you are ischemic and you have this detorsion event, you may have for a period of time this kind of um, subsequent hyperemia. And so if you notice that they have flow, you know, okay, that's good, right? The testicle is being perfused, but did you have, you know, did your story suggest that you had a torsion event that might have detorsed? Like, did they come in with excruciating pain uh, and maybe you tried the, you know, the open the book technique to, to reperfuse it before you did your study, uh, or maybe they spontaneously detorsed, um, their pain got better, right? And now you have this hyperemia on the previously affected side. Um, you know, it may not rule out that they didn't have a torsion. Um, it may just say, hey, look, we've, we've 
uh, we've been able to uh, reperfuse this thing. So keep that in mind. Having flow doesn't rule out the past. It just shows you kind of what's going on in the present, right? And so with that kind of tool kind of discussed, let's go now to the spectral Doppler, which is going to be that third level, that more complex level of scanning that we're going to apply to this patient as we try to determine, does this testicle have um, have evidence of torsion. So we talked about the grayscale, kind of how it looks normally, how it looks abnormally. We talked about the color Doppler appearance, how it looks normally, how it looks abnormally. Let's now look at spectral Doppler um, and see if this tool can help us out as we're evaluating these patients. And so um, spectral Doppler, again, let's just back up. Spectral Doppler in general is a graphical display, right, of these Doppler changes, right? So remember we talked just a few minutes ago about how movement in a tissue or movement of blood um, can cause that change in frequency and then the machine is displaying that. Another way that the machine can display that is in this graph, right? And so instead of being a color, right, to display uh, directionality, we're gonna graph things above or below a baseline, right? And instead of being a brighter color versus a dimmer color, we're gonna, we're gonna show the velocity as um, a location above the baseline or a location below the baseline or how far above or how far below the baseline. And so uh, we're going to show that, you know, in each of these, you know, blood particles, right, that's getting picked, that's getting interrogated, it's going to display as a little speckle on that tracing. Uh, and it's going to be either of a certain velocity uh, or a certain side of the baseline. That's going to help us get some, some quantitative numbers uh, as we try to interrogate what's going on. So by convention, right, anything that moves toward the transducer is going to be above the baseline. Anything that moves away from the transducer is going to be the below, below the baseline. And how far from the baseline is a reflection of the velocity. So on your y-axis, you have your velocity. And on your x-axis, that's displayed out over time. So beat to beat, um, you know, and so forth, right? Just like we had, um, you know, the ability to, to artifactually or create artifacts inside the Doppler, um, settings, you know, like we talked about last time with the color, we can do the same thing here. So if our pulse repetition frequency is abnormal, we can have this aliasing or wraparound effect. And so you want to not only make sure that your baseline is set okay, uh, but your scale is set appropriately so that the entire Doppler envelope from that, that column of blood is contained on its respective side of the baseline and doesn't exceed the, 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 the ability so that that settings to interrogate the, the parameters and then wrap around. So we see on the left here, I know it's kind of some complex talk, but on the, on the left you see a beat, you know, the, each beat above the baseline is cut off at the top and then the rest of it's displayed, you know, as beginning at the very bottom, kind of approaching the baseline. Um, that's called aliasing on spectral Doppler. And so what you want to do is you want to compress your scale such that you can get a nice even beat like we see on the right hand side of the screen where that entire envelope seen on its respective side of the baseline um you know as we want to kind of optimize things for our study right so this is very you know arterial i mean obviously this is just transmitral valve flow but it's very pulse tile flow the other thing we're going to be looking for uh is venous type flow right so you can see that slow undulating uh waveform that doesn't have those profound beat to beat uh peaks we, you know here we see just a little bit of just kind of pulse utility to it but mostly just kind of this slow kind of movement uh, uh, of fluid uh, that's detected by our spectral Doppler um, in these patients, right? And so let's apply that to our testicles, right? Um, what we should be expecting to see is two things, right? We should be expecting to see some venous flow, right? And we should be expecting to see some arterial flow. And when we torse the testicle, what you will first expect to have happen is the lowest pressure system to cease flowing, right? And so will have uh, that venous side be compressed proximally and all of a sudden you don't have a lot of venous outflow and we're gonna lose theoretically our, our venous flow. And as you continue to torse the thing, as you compress the arterial side, then we're gonna lose that, that arterial side flow. And so what you wanna demonstrate when you're doing your testicle scan is you wanna demonstrate that you have not only arterial flow, but you also have venous flow. And so here what we're doing is we're basically taking the testicle we're applying color Doppler to see, okay, where are those little speckles of, of blood flow inside the testicle? And then putting our pulse wave calipers over those speckles and evaluating what does the waveform look like? And we want to demonstrate that you have both venous flow on the affected side and arterial flow. And so here's venous flow. 
where you can see just kind of that slow, decently non-pulsatile, kind of low velocity kind of rumbling of fluid uh, as it's just kind of slowly moving its way uh, outside or out of, out of the, the testicle and back up into the venous system, right? So this is a, a good example of normal venous flow. Uh, and then moving on, we want to find arterial flow. Um, where you can actually say that this testicle is getting input from the arterial side, right? And so you have to kind of hunt around, find one of those speckles that represents arterial flow. Um, and here we see that very pulsatile uh, waveform that is suggestive of, of arterial, arterial flow, right? Now, that's all good, but there's one other thing that we want to really take note of and differentiate as we're scanning these testicles, um, specifically vis-a-vis -vis the arterial flow, right? And so not only do you need to have arterial flow, but you need to have low resistance arterial flow, right? Um, and if you haven't kind of been, you know, you know, read or, or heard about this concept, there's two different types of flow essentially that we're going to pick up on ultrasound inside the body. It's going to be either high resistance or it's going to be low resistance. And I suppose you can make an argument that there's a spectrum there too, but generally speaking, if you put your probe on something, it's going to be one of those two patterns, right? It's going to be either high resistance or low resistance. And low resistance is typically seen in organ structures that are very flow dependent, right? You just want to get a ton of flow in there. You don't want to have a lot of impedance to that flow uh, because you need the perfusion. And so these are going to be things like testicles, but also things like the kidney and things like the brain and stuff like that, right? And so um, when you have these distal end organs that are flow dependent, you want to see this low resistance waveform contrasted with a high resistance waveform, which is going to look something like this top image here. And these are going to be more of your transit vessels, right? And so if you do like a brachial artery or something like that, you're going to see kind of this more very sharp peak and trough high resistance waveforms. And so the difference that you're going to notice is one of two things. Um, it's going to have kind of that more sharp peak, right? Um, it's also high resistance waveforms are going to tend to have kind of this dark spot inside of it, right? I don't have a cursor that I can put on there, but if you look at the upper waveform, you can see a very well outlined, you know, upslope and downslope with that dark spot, that black triangle inside of it. And that's called the Doppler window, right? And so what this represents is that most of the velocities, most of those blood cells that are traveling through this, this, um, this, in this situation, a blood vessel, but this transit system um, are going in a very narrow band of velocity ranges, right? Um, you know, so it's this, you can see this high resistance flow, right? So you have this spectral window compared with the bottom one, right? This is gonna be a low resistance circuit uh, where you have a, a loss of that spectral window, which means a lot more of these blood cells are gonna go in, in a variety of different velocities, not just all within this narrow band. And so, so you'll see that's number one, you know, kind of that loss of the spectral window. But the second thing you'll see is kind of what does it do relative to the baseline, right? And so in a high, in a classic high resistance pattern, you're gonna see that very sharp spike, that sharp down spike, and then maybe even flow reversal as you hit that dichrotic notch and then kind of hit, you know, going to diastole. So most of your flow happens in systole with some reversal of flow or not a lot of flow in diastole. But we know that's not what happens in these distal organ systems, right? In the testicles, a lot of the perfusion happens not necessarily in systole, but throughout diastole, right? And so in these um, low resistance circuits, you'll see not only that closing of the spectral window, but you'll also see that the, the, the velocity does not return down to baseline throughout diastole. And so we'll go back to this one here. You can see the kind of that, that gradual up spike and then this gradual over the course of diastole, you know, loss of, of velocity um, as we're waiting for that next systolic beat. And so this here is a classic example of low resistance uh, patterns. And it's what you want to see as you're doing your scan of these testicles. Uh, if you start seeing, oops, went too far. If you start seeing a transition from low resistance to high resistance, then you need to say, hey, do we have some partial torsion going on where we may have some obstruction to flow, right? We may be converting that low resistance into a high resistance, but not a complete loss of arterial flow. Uh, and, and it may be an early marker of kind of worsening things in the, um, that may be coming down the road. And in my opinion, certainly uh, an indication to get your urology consults on board and say, hey, look, I think I got something that's, that's partially torsed here um, that needs to be looked at. And so with that being said, um, that's kind of the, 
the main gist of, of, of testicular ultrasound. And like I said, we, you know, I was, told you I was going to talk about it or, or tell you what I was going to talk about, talk about it, and then kind of tell you what I talked about. And so as we wrap up and as we review, uh, we want to remember kind of the one, two, threes of testicular ultrasound. Number one, what's the grayscale? Is it uh, of a similar size? Is it of a homogeneous equitexture? Or are we violating those rules? In which case we go to number two, right? And say, okay, do we have color Doppler on the testicle? Like if there's no color Doppler on one and there is on the other and the settings haven't changed, then you gotta be worried, right? Um, and then we wanna take that to the next level, right? And add the, the flow aspect on it and say, I wanna not only show that I have venous flow, right? Because I can have color on a partial torsion, right? Um, that I still lose venous, but still have arterial, right? Uh, so I wanna show that there's both venous, right? And I wanna show that there's low resistance arterial waveforms. And so number three is, can you find a venous waveform? And then can you find an arterial waveform? as you're evaluating this patient. If you can go all the way one, two, three, and find all those things, right, then you can be decently assured that this patient's testicle is probably not tourist, uh, and I need to start looking for something else as the cause of their pain, right? So hopefully that has been able to add another tool in your toolbox. Again, having picture of hammers in a lecture about testicular torsion sounds a little bit painful, uh, but the picture is designed to be kind of a, a memory jog to say this is a tool in your toolbox um, as you apply these, um, these scans to your patients and evaluate the patients at the bedside.